Hello. Today is Thursday, March 21st, 2019. I am Nira Gopi, Director of the Division of Policy and Education at OLO, and today it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Catherine Shupley, to the online OLO online seminars to present Superstar Rats Teach Empathy to Researchers. Kathy's personal and professional life has always been intertwined with animals, whether as a teenager living in Tanzania, visiting the Serengeti for holidays, as a social scientist interviewing beach ran ranchers in Alberta, or as a veterinarian caring for la laboratory rodents. Her compassion for animals and desire to safeguard their welfare has been the driving force in her career. Kathy has a Bachelor's of Science in Zoology from the University of Guelph and a Master of Science in Zoology from the University of Alberta. She then went on to do a PhD in Animal Welfare at the University of British Columbia and more recently a DVM at the University of Saskatchewan. Kathy is currently a clinical assistant professor in the Animal Welfare Program in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and a clinical veterinarian in Animal Care Services at the University of British Columbia. Kathy's research interests include understanding the relationship of humans with animals, research ethics, and researching practical ways to improve the emotional experiences of animals involved in animal research. Her work attempts to apply research findings to improve policy and practice and resolve conflict related to animal welfare. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the OLA online seminar and now to hand the microphone over to Dr. Shupley. Thank you for that introduction, Nira, and thank you, Ola, for inviting me to participate in this web webinar. Thank you all today for attending this talk as well. Uh, this is my first time doing a webinar, uh, so I apologize if there's any awkwardness. I'll try to imagine you all sitting out there. Today, I'm very excited to be speaking about a study that used research rats to influence the views of individuals working with research animals with the goal of promoting positive welfare or refinement. I will begin by introducing you to the research team for which I'm gratefully indebted to for all their hard work, for having lots of fun, and for enriching our lives. First, I'd like to introduce you to the, re the rat team. This is a group of seven amazing rats we call the superstar rats. Orca, Grandin, Jane, Marie, Anne, Teresa, and Amelia. As you can see, we try to choose famous female scientists as names as well as other famous women. The second part of the team is the people team. Um, uh, the human members and collaborators, uh, Billy, Joyce, Vivian, Lara, Naveen, Sarah, Vanessa, Andrea, Joanna, and Dan. Many of these were undergraduates who volunteered a lot of their time to this project. This team of rats and people played an extremely important role in a study whose overall aim was to test if exposure to well-socialized rats that demonstrate complex mental and behavioral capabilities increases empathy of those working with research animals. So why did I embark on this study? Well, I, people matter. Within laboratory environments, I believe that a key element to achieving good animal welfare is having caring people who work with animals, and that includes both researchers and animal care staff. Caring people are likely more attentive to their research animals. In animal research, we often have animals under the care of a variety of people, often in very dispersed labs, and so we really rely on every individual to take care of the animals well. In the bigger picture, I believe that implementation of refinements also requires people who are motivated to make changes. So attitudes of people working with animals is critical to safeguarding animal welfare. So what are the features of caring people, and how do we get caring people? 
Empathy and compassion are considered important aspects of animal care. Empathy serves to establish concern and connection with another being. It directs our attention towards another and makes us take an interest in what is going on with that other being. Empathy makes someone want to refrain from hurting and instead helping another. Thus, a lack of em empathy makes us less interested in the situation of others and how we affect them. So in my view, these are ideal qualities for safeguarding animal welfare. Another closely related and overlapping concept uh, that evolved from psychology research on attitudes towards animals is the concept of belief in animal mind, or BAM. Belief in animal mind includes beliefs that animals are self-aware, capable of solving problems, that they experience emotions such as fear, pleasure, depression, and so on. Such perceived mental endowment of animals is known to foster empathetic feelings. For example, research has shown that people who are proponents of belief in animal mind are more concerned about animal welfare, they behave more humanely towards animals, and they have more empathy to both animals and humans. So in conclusion then, it seems reasonable to think that the research community benefits from people who believe in animal mind with empathy and compassion. So how do we get such people? That was the goal of this study. So my goal was to develop an educational intervention using rats that capitalized on features important to fostering empathy. Some research suggests that considering empathy with animals is an important factor that should be considered when creating humane educational programs. At my university, the University of British Columbia, as at many other institutions, and I'm sure in most of your institutions as well, uh, there are mandatory training programs where animal researchers and animal care staff receive education and training about the species they work with, often including basic handling. Uh, these courses are mandatory at UBC, so we designed an intervention as part of one of these courses for rats, which was called Introduction to Working with Rodents in Research. The students enrolled in this class were exposed to either regular, which I call control, or superstar rats, the, interven the education intervention, or the treatment rats, and I'll explain those in more detail. For the intervention, Students observed seven highly trained rats, these superstar rats that I introduced at the beginning of my talk. They observed them perform, and I'll explain that more in detail later. The intervention was designed to promote elements that are considered important to being empathetic. So it was designed to encourage feelings towards the rats by witnessing personalities, the relationship of the rats with the handlers, and maybe even some anthropomorphizing. Feelings of compassion motive us to direct our attention to others and take an interest in their experiences. The intervention was also um, tried to provide direct experience with rats. So we know that the more direct experience with individual animals, the more likely we perceive them as deserving of empathy and compassion. And finally, the intervention tried to increase the understanding of the mental experiences of the rats. To help foster empathy, it helps to learn more about the mental experiences of animals, to increase the similarity between us and them. So the idea was that when students see these cool superstar rats, they'll go back to their labs and they'll think a little differently about their own research animals. For example, maybe be a little more attentive to how they're doing after surgery or other procedures. The regular rats, or the control rats, uh, involved students who were enrolled in the class. They just saw the typical rats that were not trained, that had a limited amount of handling and socialization with humans prior to the class. The study involved four phases, socialization, training, educational intervention, and focus groups. So phase one and two were necessary to prepare the rats for the actual educational intervention, to get them interacting and working calmly with people and to make them the superstars. The final phases, three and four, were used for showcasing the rats in the intervention and for evaluating whether intervention influenced attitudes, at least in the short term. To give you a sense of the environment where the rats were housed, uh, the rats were, we kept them in these two-level critter nation 
commercial pet cages. The rats were provided with a number of enrichments as shown in the picture. Their housing room was equipped with red lighting, as you can see here. As many of you know, rats are nocturnal and they cannot see the wavelength red. So when red is on, it's as if it's nighttime for, the, for them. So that way we could work with them in the red light when they were most active. And we thought training would work better in their active hours. And that's where we, uh, however, um, ultimately the rats would end up in the uh, room where the intervention took place, which had white lighting. So we did transition rats to room to areas with white lighting at some point. Uh, phase one of the study involved socialization. We started with two pregnant rats, a Sprague Dolly and a Long Evans from Charles River. Once they gave birth, we started a gradual and gentle socialization program where we got the rats used to our presence and handling. We started with getting pups and dams used to our smell. We placed pieces of material into the nest that smelled of us. We actually wore them under our clothes. We put hand, our hands in the cages to let us, them smell us. And over time, we touched the pups, eventually lift them up and so on, all the time ensuring the mothers were OK with this. The second phase was the training phase. Uh, and for training, we use positive reinforcement training techniques using a clicker and a target. I'm sure many of you have heard of these methods, very common in dogs, also used in, in research, especially for non-human primates and dogs. Training began at about four weeks of age. We started in the housing room, then moved to a different training room, and finally ended up in the classroom where the intervention would take place. Um, here are just a couple of general observations about our training. We found that the Long Evans rats were more successfully trained than the Sprague Dollies. Both male and female rats were initially trained, but males became a little less focused um, once uh, puberty, the onset of puberty. So ultimately, we continued with a small subset of females for the training program and the intervention. Here's a, an example of some initial training. There's no audio, but I'll walk you through it. So we direct the rat to go to the scale with the target. We click and then give the reward. Direct the rat to the box, click, feed the reward. Back to the scale, click reward. We used, uh, sorry, just to say we used Cheerios um, as their reward, uh, and they loved that. Uh, we had no nipping issues at all with related to the rewards. So once the rats were trained, they were ready for the intervention. On the day of the intervention, um, Sarah and Vanessa, as shown here, would bring the rats into the classroom in this big transport box. In the classroom, we showcased the rats performing the tasks that we had trained. Uh, we when it came time for handling the handling exercises, the students were given the superstar rats to practice with. Here you can see roughly what the setup looked like. Students were seated around a U-shaped table. We would let the rats free range on the tabletop. We called the rats by their name, and we ourselves uh, did not actually wear gloves. You can see the computer screens in the background. Um, those computer screens were cycling a sort of a show of slides, some of which you saw earlier, um, that highlighted the individuals and their personalities. My own team came up with these characteristics of each rat. For example, here's a slide of Marie. Marie is 100% food motivated, would sell her siblings for treats. Another slide is Grandin. Grandin probably loves to fetch more than any dog. So I'll go through um, an example of a sort of a shortened version of some of the same things that the, the students would see. Um, and there is some audio that we're trying to coordinate, so hopefully it works uh, well. So uh, play video, please.
So, um, <clears throat> sorry, find my place. Um, so after completion of the class, the students were asked to join me for a pizza lunch where we chatted about their impressions of the class, their perspectives of the rats, and their views on how they might inter interact with rats going forward. Here's a summary of the focus groups. We had eight focus groups, about three to six people per group. Um, uh, we had three control and five intervention groups. There were 29 participants, 25 researchers, four veterinary technicians, 20 females, nine males. Uh, the researchers were mostly graduate students and postdocs. Uh, their areas of research ranged from neuroscience to immunology. And 50% um, had previous experience with rats, either as researchers or um, a few had them as pets at some point. During the focus group, I asked participants eight and open-ended questions, which were recorded and transcribed. And here are several examples of some of the questions. First, what was your experience when you handled the rats? Did you learn anything new about the rats? Do you feel your experiences with the rats in the class might influence how you care for and interact with your rats later? For analysis of the focus groups, Transcripts were analyzed using qualitative analysis. I used a method called constant comparison, which is basically uh, involves reading over the transcripts many times, dividing the text into small components or segments, uh, which were classified. And this process continued until emergent patterns appeared within all the data. And these were subsequently identified as themes. And today I will use quotes to illustrate the themes, a few themes. Today I'll prevent, present three major themes. Uh, the majority of the results I'll present will be from the intervention focus groups. I have a few comments from the control groups and I'll point those out uh, when they come. Of course, a major question in this study is whether there was evidence of empathy or belief in animal mind. Many comments demonstrated that the intervention supported an empathetic perspective and people were proponents of belief in animal mind. In some cases, as a result of the intervention, and in other cases, participants entered the class with those beliefs. So the next few slides will show you some results from the intervention. First, um, rats are amazing. So remember, a goal of the intervention was to promote an emotional response to rats. The intervention definitely promoted an emotional response. All participants in the intervention recounted a sense of amazement and surprise when they watched the rats perform. They were also impressed by their intelligence as reflected in what they could be trained to do. For example, this researcher said, yeah, my dog can't do any of that. Note that this language or description was lacking from the control groups. Participants commented that the intervention helped them to see that the rats had personalities and it made them want to meet the rat. For example, this researcher said, I thought it was funny that they knew their names and they could respond to their names. It made them like they had their own separate little personalities, especially with the slide up there. So when I went to handle the rat. I was like, who is this? I wanted to know, which is weird because in my lab, it's just numbers. There was also evidence that participants believed rats were capable of experiencing emotions and that it was reciprocated. For example, this researcher said, they enjoy the handlers, they enjoy the interaction. And another researcher said, so now I know they would understand if I give them love. I feel like they would understand it, so I can actually make their lives better by giving them more attention. Another important finding is that the participation in the intervention reminded students of their moral responsibilities to their research subjects which they felt was good. I call this a nudge in the right direction. This researcher said, it's a really good way of reminding us students that these are animals, creatures. They are intelligent. They aren't just a tool. Treat them humanely, treat them correctly. I think it's just a good reminder. And oh yeah, they are adorable. So overall, there was good support for the prediction that those who participated in the intervention were positively affected by the rats and that this did foster empathy and compassion. In the, for the control groups, in contrast, 
few comments were related to the rats that they met in class. Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot one quote, just going back. This researcher said, I think about them differently now. Why and I just anesthetize rats and take their brain out? We actually got to see more of what they're capable of. I have a bit more respect for them. Sorry about that. So moving on to the control groups. As I mentioned, there were a few comments related to the rats they met in class. However, participants did, some participants did mention that they were cute. The focus of the discussion in the control classes were, um, were mostly on what was learned in class and often on the te technical aspects. For example, when asked about their general impressions of doing the handling exercise with rats, this researcher said, yeah, I learned that thing that once I grab the rat outside the cage and I should turn around so the rat may not get into the cage again, that's something I learned new here. A second major theme was related to the type of human-animal relationship that was displayed in the intervention between the handlers, us, and the rats. There were many discussions about this, and in those discussions, the relationship was considered as more pet-like, and several sub-themes arose from that. First, this intervention improved the learning environment and handling skills for participants. How did it do that? The class reduced fear of being bitten while learning how to handle rats. Many had fears of being bitten coming into the class. However, because they witnessed the way in which the handlers interacted with their rats, um, the handlers being us, they could easily see that the rats were calm and unstressed and having fun. For example, this researcher said, I saw how you were handling the rats and you were using your hands. When I first saw them, I was a little taken aback. And then I just noticed that you were comfortable with them and that made me feel like they wouldn't bite. The second theme related to the human-animal relationship was the consequences of knowing your research animal. While the goal of this study was not to show people how to follow the approach we used in our intervention, such as clicker training rats and developing relationships with rats, we were simply trying to influence attitudes Nevertheless, participants talked a lot about how uh, about this how our approach uh, about our approach, and they imagined what it would be like to implement a similar kind of socialization and training program in their own labs, and what the consequences would be if they did that. There were differing views and concerns about becoming attached, bonded, or connected to their research subjects, and whether getting to know their research subject would result in a greater emotional burden for animal researchers, in particular when animals needed to be euthanized as part of the research. For some participants, this was considered an acceptable burden because this was the moral responsibility of doing their work. At least the rats were treated well and with respect during their time as research subjects. For others, this burden was considered too difficult. For example, this researcher hypothesized that, as a researcher, it would be a lot harder to sacrifice them. I think because usually they just have numbers, right? Them having names and you having that connection with them, I think I already have a hard time with the sacrifice, so I think it might make it even harder. But at least they lived a happy, fun little life, right? As mentioned, the human-animal relationship witnessed by participants was described as pet-like. Some comments suggested a moral unease about blurring the boundary between pets and the tradi traditional view of research animals. And the traditional view is one of viewing animals as a means to an end rather than as pets or animals where, we, where people have personal connections. For example, naming was not permitted in one facility because it fostered a personal relationship. As this animal technician described, so our boss said, just said, no one's naming anything. We're just doing it the researcher way. The last theme that I will discuss today is related to data validity. It was very interesting that many focus groups discussed the potential consequences of such a program, again, the training and socialization, et cetera, the consequences of this program on data, um, when they uh, on on their own data, um, 
there was lack of consensus on how the human-animal relationship affects data. In some cases, it was, re it was reviewed as positively uh, in the sense of that it reduced stress, which equals better data. For example, this researcher said, if we could just get them into the anesthetization chamber a lot more easily, it would reduce a lot of stress. I mean, even stress could sometimes influence experimental results. In contrast, others viewed this negatively by a bias. For example, that familiarity with individual research subjects increased risk of bias. For example, this researcher, researcher suggested that's also kind of important for us because we have to do blind study right. We should really know them rats. At, we shouldn't really know them rats at all because that might compromise the study. If you have a favorite one, then we may give them better treats or whatever. So overall, there was lack of consensus on what the best approach was to ensure data integrity. So to finish up with some conclusions, there were a variety of benefits, limitations, challenges, and opportunities that arose from the results. The intervention uh, had some benefits. For example, I believe it shows promise for promoting empathy and com compassion. It reminds us of our moral obligations towards research animals. It improves the learning environment for handling uh, by reducing fear of being bitten. And finally, such an intervention has the potential to impact a large number of people. As I mentioned earlier, many institutions have similar classes around the world. So there is a lot of scope for uh, implementing something like this in a, in a large, for a large number of people. There were also a lot of challenges that were raised by the results. The comment related to data validity suggests that there is a need for explicit discussions regarding the variety of variables impacting data and how to balance them with welfare. For those with views that had negative effects, there was also failure to acknowledge that all handling and husbandry, example, lack of socialization or high levels of socialization, are also factors that potentially impact data. And I'll just remind you that these were young researchers starting their careers in science. The longer term benefits need to be evaluated. This was a, a short term study looking at immediate impacts. Obviously, our hope would be for longer in term impacts, but we didn't evaluate them. Related to the longer term impacts, though, is the issue of overcoming barriers within laboratory cultures. We know from anthropology research that the culture of individual labs plays a big role in the way the lab treats and cares for their animals. So even if single participants returned with a new approach, they might quickly fall back into their old habits. Key role models can be important, and some participants in my study pointed out that they found this to be important in their own labs. So our data showed that us that role modeling the relationship of handlers with rats was helpful, so hopefully some of these participants can go back and act as role models in their own labs. In general, though, I believe it's important to foster such a culture within the science, within the science community as a whole. The study highlighted the challenges related to the human-animal relationship. There was moral unease about viewing rats as pets, and there were concerns for the potential emotional burden of becoming more attached. And these are very important considerations, but also positive opportunities. First, these findings point to the importance of providing support for researchers so that they can cope with the emotional burden when they do develop relationships with their animals. For example, this might be in the form of better support groups, recognitions of challenges, and so on. However, I also see this as a positive opportunity where the good life for animals is tied to the good life for humans. While it's true that people feel sad about euthanizing animals or causing harm, I feel that a very powerful way of coping with this is that with that is to feel confident that you were able to provide a good life for those animals. And here I include not just the type of relationship, but other refinements such as improved housing, etc. 
I'll leave you with one quote from a member of my own research team who was interviewed herself about her experiences using animals in research. She spoke about how she felt better about euthanasia because she had given the rats a better life. And I believe that this is a powerful message. So Naveen said, and in my mind, I'm so happy that they got to hang out and have what I see as a more positive welfare filled life than some of the other rats at the facility. To me, the positive part of the relationship outweighs that single feeling of grief every single time. So in conclusion, I would again like to thank all of you for your attention. It was a pleasure to share my work with you. And in particular, I would like to thank Johns Hopkins Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, who funded this project. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if there's no time, please feel free to contact me via the email that's listed on this slide. Thank you, Dr. Shipley. That was terrific. And I'm sure that the listeners do have questions. Listeners, please type your questions into the chat box on your webinar screen. Olo may edit the questions for clarity, duplication, and fidelity to today's topic. We will start first with a few questions that we received before the webinar. Kathy, what were the criteria used for selecting the superstar rats? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we started with 23 pups and we worked with all of them for a period of time. Eventually it became impractical to train every rat so we started to select a subset and we used criteria sort of based on their ability to learn, ability to be calm and perform in a variety of setting, settings. Um, so ultimately uh, we continued with a small sub subset of females for the training program and these were as mentioned mostly the Long Evans rats. Thank you. So next question. How can institutions apply the results of your study to train or educate animal users? Thank you. Uh, the, the video is available just uh, for anyone who wants it. Please contact me via the email address and I'll send you a, a copy or a link to the copy. Um, I'd like to get it online so you could download it, but I haven't got that organized yet, unfortunately. Um, I have not tried using the video alone in our own training program to see if it's as effective as using actual rats. Um, however, se several institutions around the world um, have taken my video and have incorporated it into their own education programs with researchers. Unfortunately, I haven't heard back from anyone about how it's going. Um, for example, the RSPC in the UK is, is using it in their educational materials for training early scientists and animal care technicians. Um, so. Um, I'd encourage you to borrow it to, to, if you'd like it. Uh, one thing I would add, though, is that I think in these in in the training programs that we shouldn't shy away from speaking about animal motions. In animal research, um, it's very these contradictory notions of both empathy and instrumentalism, so using animals as means to end, are always present. And in the process of becoming scientists, uh, we should make sure that the animal is not um, distanced or uh, anonymous in that process. Thank you, and so true. So question three, how is such an intensive approach, the animal training, et cetera, that you described applicable to large scale studies? Thank you, yeah, that's a common question. Um, and uh, probably related to the, the focus that the participants in the, in the intervention also had on, on that aspect of, of seeing the rats. So just first, um, my intent was not to suggest that everybody needs to go out and use positive reinforcement training, although I'd love that. Um, there are certainly lots of logistical challenges and limitations, such as working in highly biosecure facilities for implementing such a program. But there are other aspects of the approach that could be important. Uh, for example, the time taken to get to know your animals, used to handling, to minimize stress, etc. I, I do think that we have to be careful to not underestimate the impacts that poor welfare has on data. And so we need to keep in mind the potential benefits of such approaches that do improve animal welfare. 
So maybe it's not positive reinforcement training, but it could be better enriched housing, appropriate handling, such as the tube handling published by Gouvieva and Hurst, or adequate so socialization programs, for example. Okay, thank you, Kathy. So the fourth question was, what was the duration of your study, and are there plans to follow up with participants in the long term? Yeah, that would be fantastic. So the study was about one year. Um, the rats were showcased for about four months or so. And, and yeah, it would be very important to follow with, up with participants further out from the intervention to see whether the intervention had an impact or what challenge this they faced. Um, so, I, so I had that intent. So far, I was only able to follow up one person one year later. Um, she did speak to us about how she definitely remembered the intervention and she thought about it many times. Um, since graduate students and postdocs are pretty transient, um, at this point I think I, I would need to start with a new group of rats solely with the intention of following people long term, but I think that's very important and that would be great and hopefully I can do that. Okay. So fifth question, can you elaborate on how your results affect or impact compassion fatigue? Yeah, this is a very important consideration and one that fortunately I think has been receiving more attention lately. I'm sure many of you have seen presentations or heard or read about uh, compassion fatigue or heard the term culture of care. Um, unfortunately, there's little evidence-based research on therapeutic intervention in the animal care feel fields. We, we have to rely a lot on what is taken from compassion fatigue in human medicine. Um, I personally would rather that people don't cope with by shutting down. I think that engaging in positive interactions with animals leads to increased morale and job satisfaction in caregivers, which leads ultimately to better care and improved animal well-being. So, um, it's important for both animals and humans, and this is true and has been found in human medicine as well. However, of course, we do need to be mindful of the impacts. Um, a cultural, culture of care, which is used a lot, is a uh, term that, or a culture that supports well-being of animals and people, and that areas that have been suggested as important to the culture of care include creating an environment where staff feel empowered to come forward with concerns or suggestions they have, to improve animal care and use programs, one that respects and nurtures staff compassion, uh, cultures where me there are mechanisms to support sort of open communications about these issues, programs that recognize good work uh, of staff and researchers, senior management or administrators that reinforce commitment to animal welfare and the three R's and acknowledge the challenges in the job uh, when there is grief or loss of the animal. Um, in the human medicine programs, in sort of mindfulness programs are, are very important and there's evidence that they work. So something similar in animals I think is important basically where people can self-recognize when problems are occurring and self-care for themselves. Um, I did some interviews uh, in a previous study with uh, researchers and um, others, uh, IACAP members basically, and I heard interesting stories around sort of different ways of dealing with this and um, there was one example where technicians really needed their, their principal investigator to come in the lab so they, they could sort of share the burden. However, that's their actual investigator didn't want to come in the lab because they felt morally uncomfortable about that process, about the animals being in research. So they both had these similar concerns and they sort of dealt with them differently but it's important, I think, to acknowledge that and, and, and share more, perhaps. Um, there are a variety of things I, that, are, are, that are in the literature now and, uh, and that institutions are implementing, and I think that's gra great, and I'm glad they're receiving attention. I don't think we, you know, we've, we've solved the problem yet. Um, so, yeah, it's a good question. Okay. So you mentioned this. Um, during your talk, and I guess we'd like a little bit more elaboration and what, in your opinion, how do you think your results affect the integrity of research data and reproducibility? Yeah, I think this, this is a very important 
question. And um, I, for me, I think there's two important aspects to this. First, I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard about these current discussions going on about the translatable, translatability crisis of the animal models, these problems with the animal model. Why aren't we getting enough um, you know, final uh, clinical outcomes for a lot of the work? The second part is the increasing evidence of the impacts of many variables on data validity, validity including how we house and care and interact with animals. And I think these, these variables potentially play a role in this crisis. And there are, Joe Garner and et al. Um, has a nice paper that sort of parses out all these different components. So we cannot ignore things like appropriate socialization of rats or other species or finding ways to reduce stress and improve, improve well-being. Uh, including possibly positive reinforcement training, because these may be essential to an effective animal ultimately. So in, again, sort of keep in mind that my study was aimed at fostering a culture of empathy, um, but I do think that that's also tied to creating a generation of scientists who are ethically motivated to safeguard animal welfare, but also to be vigilant and honest about the strengths and weaknesses of the animal model itself, uh, to ask to look for improvements where possible, for example. Okay, thank you, Kathy. So did you ever consider carrying out a pre- and post-intervention survey on empathetic attitudes to see if attitudes changed over time? Yes, I did, and I had originally set out to do that. I, there's a couple of validated surveys out there that assess empathetic attitudes and, and belief in animal mind, um, and I did plan on doing a pre post comparison. However, um, when I started, I had so few participants actually take the survey before the class, so I kind of ended up having to give up. While I did approach everyone um, via email to ask them to volunteer for the study, very few participants actually volunteered ahead of time um, until, but I would walk into the class in the morning before it started and talk about my study, and that's mostly when people agreed to participate. Um, and so I just kind of had to accept that the best, the best data that I could get uh, from this group of people was the focus group immediately following the class. And that was the easiest way, the focus group, having it at that time was also the easiest way um, to get, uh, get them to volunteer to talk to me. So yeah, these are the typical limitations of the, these kinds of survey interview type studies. Okay, so we're getting some interesting questions in for you, Kathy. First question, how was the IRB human subjects process handled? And were the participants told about the purpose of the study up front? Right, good question. And so I had the pleasure of dealing with both IRB and IACUC on the study. Um, so uh, yeah, that was challenging. Um, the, the IRB, so yeah, it's a little bit tricky because the IRB, of course, wants full transparency to anyone in terms of the consent process and what they're informed about. But yes, we didn't want to influence the results by uh, saying too much in the consent process. And in the there was an introductory letter uh, that sort of gave an overview, and then there was the official consent process. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, um, but we kind of pitched it more along the lines of we didn't um, of that you know this is a training class. We'd like to improve the training class, uh, and we'd like their input on how to do that. You know, we they were they're going to work with some rats and that sort of thing. So we we definitely tried to steer away from any language that would suggest we were trying to promote empathy or change attitudes and that sort of thing. We were really, we just kind of made it more around, we would like your feedback on how the class is going. Um, uh, so yeah, um, we did edit at some point the consent form because there was something in it that seemed a little, maybe a bit more um, that way. Um, but so it, it's, a, it's, it's really tough. Uh, and, but the IRBs, aware of this issue so and and we weren't doing anything harmful to the to the participants who volunteered so little you know by not being completely transparent it wasn't likely to you know cause any negative impact or harm to the 
participants, so, you know, not so serious as it might be for certain, for other clinical kind of studies, but, um, yeah, otherwise the process was pretty, pretty went pretty well. Um, our biggest challenge was just actually getting people to volunteer. Okay. So how long did the actual training of the rats, those superstar rats, take? Right. Yeah, good question. And so I, in hindsight, I wish we'd kept more detail because our, you know, they were, it was really a secondary goal for us personally to kind of learn more. This is my first time training rats as well. Um, so we wanted to learn how to do that effectively, um, but that wasn't our primary goal. Primary goal, so we weren't like, you know, trying to speed it up or whatever. Uh, and also some of the two main people who helped training um, were also learning, so that to keep that in mind. So I can't say precisely how long it took. I mean, it was, I think it took, it took a pretty long time, probably several months, but at the same time we were doing, like the actual clicker association super fast, getting them onto the scale and that target training was pr pretty fast. I, I mean, I can't say for sure, but it was probably a couple of weeks uh, easily done. Uh, but then we realized we sort of started with the idea, let's kind of demonstrate lab specific kinds of skills. And then we thought, oh, we let's expand that to make the rats a little bit more fun looking. So then we kind of opened it up to whatever, uh, whatever the rats kind of were willing to do. And we definitely kind of tried to capitalize on the rats' individual propensities or likes of doing certain things, which is, uh, you know, some rats did really were good at fetching. Um, others were less adventurous and did different things. We had a, there's a lot more things that it, were not on the video um, that we did train them to do. Um, uh, we got them selecting, you know, we tell them go pick the syringe up, go pick this uh, blood container up, and they'd go off and do that. Um, we did some, like, various walking on their hind legs and some high-fiving and some jumping and stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's hard for me, unfortunately, to, to really say for sure how long it took, um, partly because we were learning and just trying a bunch of different things. So um, it, was, it was a pretty intensive process overall. So um, we did, after I finished and the rats were getting older, we started to try to look at training more, and we tried to do a few specific things like um, use them to go into the induction box where we were trying to train them to um, calmly tolerate isoflurane introduction through positive reinforcement training. So for that, we spent more time and we documented very carefully every day with videos how they were progressing uh, um, and things like that. So. Um, I have some of that information, but so you ended up with some your little personal assistants and cheerleaders at your side, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, this we had. I had in the end that huge team of people were all mostly volunteer undergraduate students who just who came in religiously to train the rats to do things. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So here's another question I think is on everyone's mind: Were the trained rats euthanized? And if so, who did the euthanasia, and did you consider adoption? Right, good question, yeah. Uh, we definitely, uh, we considered adoption. We did adopt out um, some of the males. Um, we, in, it is interesting. So our, our institution does allow adoption on a case-by-case -by -case basis. And I, um, I, we have, we're pretty open in our tours with undergrads and so on. And I used to tell people all the time when they'd come through, does anyone want to adopt these rats? And, you know, you don't get a lot of people, unfortunately. Even the people who worked with them, you know, they could, their apartments didn't allow them to have rats and stuff like that. So it wasn't easy, even though I pushed hard for that. So we did use the rats and we thought it you know to go to carry on with just practicing training and doing a variety of things not specifically in the intervention and we did that for quite a while so they they did age up to close to two years most of them um, so they did live in the research setting um, with a lot of interaction um, I ended up uh, for the ones that were euthanized who were at most of them um, I ended up euthanizing them uh, we, I also have an interest in improving euthanasia methods as well. Um, so we did, I kind of use them for a variety of things like pre-dosing with midazolam, fentanyl, things, a few things like that for induction. So I, I kind of use them to kind of test out 
a few things um, around um, improving the euthanasia projects. I did also, I will say, a few rats. Um, there was a researcher who worked on, uh, he did, he worked on uh, a neuroscientist who did something with el really elderly rats, and of course it's hard to have a lot of elderly rats because of their illnesses that they get, so I did, he basically anesthetized them and, and they, it was a non-recovery, so I did let him have a couple of my rats for that. Okay, another question. Will you plan to continue this type of training as a part of regular training for your staff at your institution? Yeah, it's a good question. So, yeah, I am doing this currently. We are trying to make this a more normal thing. Now, obviously, this right now we're focused in sort of one facility where this is a bit easier. Um, so, so it's mostly a large animal facility with some small number of rodents. And so it's conventional. It's just, it's just a lot easier. So we are implementing this not just for rats. So we have a plan and we're currently in the process of developing the SOPs and and the training materials of, um, you know, so every animal that comes in that facility will have some basic positive reinforcement training for things like going onto the scale to be weighed and some basic kind of exams and that kind of stuff. That's our plan. Um, we're not, a, we don't have like some institutions that have animal trainers with the larger animals and stuff that are on staff. We don't have that, so we're struggling with um, you know, how to train our staff and make it time manageable to implement it, but there is there is a strong interest. Um, we're also trying, which is kind of fun with the animal welfare program at UBC, we do have this huge number of undergrads who want anything to do with animals, and so um, we have a lot of courses that we involve students with in we, with the laboratory animals um, and we bring them in so we try to integrate we have a rat handling program that's the pre-vet and animal welfare club and they all go through a little training and they basically come in several times per week and they handle our training animals uh, in part to make the animals get them used to being handled for class and also to um, uh, enrich the lives of those undergrads coming in so that's been going on for a few years and we have about 30 students every year who volunteer to do that. So we're always trying to find ways of bringing in other people to also help with the kind of human-animal interactions. Um, uh, but yeah, so the, we, we are trying um, to, to do this more wide, uh, bigger scale. And for those participants who, who may be interested in incorporating your video as part of their training program, you said that they can contact you and you, it can be made avail be available to them, right? Sure, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So um, we have two more questions. Do you have plans to train PIs or heads of labs? Since this was an effective, if since this was effective with young researchers, but research culture is a potential issue, this would potentially help change the culture faster. So yeah. do you have plans to tra train yeah. PIs or heads of labs? I don't have specific plans, but that's a very, very good question. And this is a really much bigger question around culture, and it's hugely important. Um, and, um, you know, there's evidence in other areas. Uh, you know, Temple Grandin's done a lot of work around slaughterhouse culture and how these, you know, management and more senior members of that culture are critical to shifting cultures or so I would agree um, and I and so there's also evidence in the literature for I don't know uh, the, the changing of scientists through their young their early career to a late stage and there is evidence that things like empathy you know not that these are like uh, you know obviously not cruel people or anything that have no empathy but these things become marginalized a little bit through the process of becoming a scientist you look at animals more as objects that's just the way it's happened so and I saw evidence of that even in my own participants there was a range of experience levels and the the brand new scientists never worked with rats again this is a little anecdotal but they, they were more um, open to the idea of uh, of seeing um, rats uh, had more emotion around it, whereas the slightly more senior researchers that came into the uh, intervention 
they even commented on that themselves that it changed for them in their own careers and they saw young people having more of that than they did etc so yeah it's a real it is a real issue so it would be great um, to do that I, I don't I mean obviously those PIs are not coming into the classes anymore but we do have um, a regular series at UBC on laboratory animal welfare that many of them attend so maybe there's ways of going back to the labs, um, the PIs, and doing a similar intervention. That would be a great idea. So one final question is, how, do, how did you maintain an SPF status when in an open environment? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's challenging for any of these kind of methods. That's true. Um, so we didn't have to worry about it too much in this particular facility that we worked in. Um, so it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't a major issue, you know, other than, um, uh, being, paying attention to, uh, exposure to like pet rats outside, you know, having people, making sure everybody, cause some people did have pet rats and they had the appropriate showering, et cetera, et cetera, when they would come in to our facility. Um, but in that facility it was, it's pretty conventional. So yes, it, they, these were clean rats, but we didn't have any issues, um, but it's also the training program facility where all the people come in, and so it's it's a bit harder to to control um, disease because you get a variety of people coming in, and you you know you make assumptions about that they're coming in with the appropriate um, showering, etc. Um, but we do accept that this is not a high biosecure facility um, for the rodents, anyways. Yeah, so it wasn't a big issue in my case, but it would be in other facilities, absolutely. Well, we've come to the end of the questions to such an interesting topic. Um, it's a hot topic, of course. If your listeners think of additional questions in the next week or two, as you reflect on this webinar, please send them in to us and we will impose on Kathy to answer them. And then we will amend them to the end of the transcript, which we will be posting on the OLA website in a, couple, in a week or two. So now I would like to thank you, Kathy. Kathy, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I'd like to thank the University of British Columbia for loaning you to us. And I want to thank all of you listeners for participating in our webinar with special thanks to those who sent in questions. So the next online OLA online seminar will be on June 13, 2019. Please mark your calendars when Dr. Lara Helwig from Brown University will talk to us about exploring what options exist, including adoption, retirement and release, when to exercise these options and how to plan for these options when designing studies which include involve animals and has completed at the end of the studies, what, what are the options that is available to these animals? This talk titled the fourth R, rehoming, retirement or release, which are options for lab laboratory animal research subjects when the study has ended. It will highlight what guidance is available from professional organizations and federal, state and local regulatory agencies developing and establishing institutional policies to facilitate these options and working with other interested parties such as research administration, IACUCs, legal and communications will also be discussed. The talk will explore establishing criteria for which animals are suitable for these options from both a veterinary and legal perspective and the due diligence required to ensure that they will be provided for in their new home. Logistical, logistical challenges drawn from past experiences will be shared along with lessons learned and caveats for future ventures. I wish everyone a good spring and look forward to having all of you join us for our next webinar in the summer of 2019. Goodbye.